Welcome to devmode.fm, a podcast dedicated to the tools, techniques, and technologies used in modern web development. I'm Andrew Welch from NY Studio 107. I'm Patrick Harrington from Mildly Geeky in Boston. And I'm Matt Stein at Working Concept in Austin. And today we have on Amelia Wattenberger, a front-end developer and UX developer at Parsley. Amelia, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. And the reason we're having you on is we wanted to talk to you about data visualization. So if you are off getting a pedicure from a school of Garufa fish at the Aso Spa <laughs> near Shinjuku Station in Tokyo, and someone next to you who is also getting a pedicure turned to you and said, hey, you know, what is data visualization anyway? What would you tell them? <laughs> Um, that's a really good question. I would probably say something like if you wanted to know how much flesh was scraped off your toes by these fish, <laughs> which I think is what they do. That is. They nibble um, they nibble all the dead skin off of your uh, feet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. On track. Um, you could either look at a table of skin eaten per minute, or we could visualize that data and turn it into something that's more accessible for humans to understand and maybe make a timeline or something like that. So turn like a table of data or something from a database into a chart or some kind of visualization that makes it more accessible. The possibilities are endless. We could go different dimensions of data. It could be the size of the chunk versus the size of the fish. This is really, yeah, we could go somewhere. Well, and also, like if you're talking about a visualization of this, would it be called a skin graph? Oh, my. <laughs> Look oh. what he did there, everybody. <laughs> I know. The that shark. was terrible. Yep. <laughs> but that leads to the obvious question, though. Like, is kind of like, you know, the first data visualization, was that maybe a chart of some kind? Oh, man. I've tried to go into the history of data visualization once, <laughs> exactly right. one time, and it gets really messy. Uh, one of the early ones that people point out is the, if anyone knows the story of Jon Snow and the cholera epidemic, where I guess it's in London, a lot of people are getting cholera and they couldn't figure out what the cause was. And then at one mm. point, Jon Snow mapped it out and you could see that all of the cases were near this one fountain. Yeah, I, I do remember reading about that because everyone at the time thought it was something like in the air. I think that was the prevailing opinion was they thought cholera was spread through the air somehow and he yeah, proved or rat. that it was, yeah, or, or rat or whatever. And he proved that it came from the a tainted water supply, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he did that through visualizing it with a map, which makes it way easier to see like, oh, wow, these are all happening around this one water station. Right. So, and, and I think that one of the reasons for that was also that they, they had the latrine right next to the water supply, I think is, was part of the the problem right uh that would make sense <laughs> you don't remember yeah i'm pretty sure that that was the case but re regardless so the the idea behind data visualization is taking data in one form and visually presenting it in a way that will make it easier to interpret i mean is that kind of what it's about yeah definitely and one of the reasons it's like not a new field but it's kind of having a renaissance right now because we had the whole data explosion where now we have tons of data from everywhere. Like we have personal data, companies have a ton of data, and we need to figure out what to do with it, right? Data is useless if you can't understand what it's saying. Right. So it's kind of a fun field right now where it's exploding and there's a lot of people working in data visualization from different fields. People like myself who work on dashboards at startup companies or researchers who are researching like the fundamentals of perception and stuff like that. And then sites like the New York Times, they're the upshot where they have all these awesome like visual articles to help people understand what they're writing about. And we had Rich Harris on here recently to talk about something completely different. So we had him on to talk about Svelte. But my understanding is that's kind of the impetus behind him writing Svelte is to be able to do some of the data visualizations like in a really efficient way was one of the reasons why he started working on it. And then he told me something I did not know is that D3, which is this library that we're going to get into and talk more about that is used 
for visualization apparently has some kind of history with the New York Times. Yeah, it was started. There's this guy named Mike Bostock who was in a lab, I think at Princeton, Jeffrey Hare's lab. They developed a library, I think called Protoviz, which was the original version of D3. And then they kept working on it. And I think they developed D3 or they developed Protoviz and then Mike Bostock went to work at the New York Times. And then he either created it there or kept developing it developing it while he was there. So it's interesting because as we want to make more and more complex visualizations, we're pushing the boundaries of what we can do with web technology. So it kind of is like a natural fit for like uh, the New York Times, who's making these cool visuals to also have to develop technologies that these will be built upon. Yeah, I mean, someone like me that I'm not in the data visualization field, but I I know of D3. It, it was surprising news to me, and maybe it shouldn't have been, but it was surprising to me that the New York Times was kind of behind or involved with, with D3, D3 in one way or another. Uh, Patrick or, or Matt, have you one of you heard of D3 or used D3 at all? Yeah, a little bit, poorly. I, I, poorly. <laughs> I, I feel like the challenge for me is knowing how to responsibly present information. Like it, it's yeah. one thing to get your hands on some data, but then it's another thing to, I don't know, identify clear needs or clear angles on looking at it. And then another yeah. thing to actually build something that design and build something that visualizes it. So I'm, yeah, I just tinkered with it, but not in a way that I would call uh, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I'm in probably the same boat. I, I've gotten into D3 a little bit, but I think very quickly realized that it gives you such fine grain control over how to present data, how to process it, how to present it, that usually I'm looking for something that's a little bit more already built, something that's more prepackaged to produce bar charts or donut charts or whatever it might be that I've used a couple uh, platforms that build upon it like C3. Uh, yeah, and then we've done Tableau for a couple other things around data visualization, which is just the, the 900 pound gorilla of data don't, vids. But don't, yeah, don't worry, Patrick, like no one's going to data shame you, you know, it, whatever, no matter what package you're using, you're still doing a data visualization in one form or another. Right? Oh, yeah. Yep. I mean, the, the way I look at it, you can have good and bad UX, right? And it will make a difference or a big difference a lot of times in, in how well someone can interact with whatever the thing is that you're building. And I think you can have good or, or bad data visualization too, right? Where you'll have the amount of or what someone will glean out of something will depend radically based on how well good of a job you've done presenting it. Is that something that you think about often, Amelia? All the time. <laughs> mm. I think the reason I'm so drawn to data visualization is because it's kind of in this intersection between more of like an art and more of a science. Mm. So because I have like a UX de designer background as well, I can use those skills and also the programming skills to create something, which is really hard, right? Part of learning how to visualize data is learning a ton of different fields, like how to design it, how we as humans perceive things visually or uh, how to actually program it or understanding colors and how to choose colors. There's a long list of things that need to be learned before making an effective data visualization. So even learning D3, which is hard in and of itself, is just part of <laughs> part of the skills that need to be developed. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I don't know how crazy this is, but when you are working on a data visualization, how much of it is about you from the point of view of that this is the way that you understand things better, like you're a more visual person, maybe so that it's it makes more sense to you to organize things in a visual way. And how much of it is about the imaginary people that are going to be consuming this thing, and you're trying to figure out the puzzle of how do I present it to them so that they'll understand it? Yeah, yeah, it's really tough. This is something that comes up a lot with user experience design, uh, where a lot of people end up doing like user studies where they create something and then user test it and then go back and iterate on it. And working on a dashboard, you kind of have to know who your users are. So mm. there are dashboards where you can put like these fancy graph charts and network charts, and then there's there are some dashboards where you can really only get away with like a bar chart. <laughs> sure. Is there, a, is there a starting point that's common for you, Amelia? Like people come to you with very specific needs. Like we need to, we have this chunk of something and we need to visualize it. Or, hey, we have a pile of information. What do we do with this? Like, is there a common or, or ideal starting point for you? Like to, 
to start with a project like this? Yeah, it's funny. What, recently, I uh, contacted someone to see if they, they said they wanted to work on a visualization for a book they're working on. And I asked them a lot of questions about like who the readers are, what they were trying to convey, what point they're trying to make. And then they got back to me saying that they realized they weren't at all ready to do a data visualization and they didn't want to do one right now. They had to do like another few months of research. So often like you'll find that the questions people want to ask aren't well scoped enough to really start on a data visualization because I prefer them to be directed towards goals as opposed to just like, hey, we have this data. Now we can see it in like a a histogram. Isn't that cool? (laughs) <laughs> so do you get into ethical gray areas then where people are like, oh, why don't you just tell us what to show? <laughs> Not that I know of yet, but I, you definitely could. <laughs> well, yeah, because this is a skill that you could be used for good or evil, right? I mean, so obviously you're going to try to present things in as neutral a way as you possibly can, but probably also like how you present the data could affect how people interpret it too. Is that possible? Oh, yeah. So what, I, uh, what I'm what i usually working on is new features for the product that I work on, which does mm-hmm. content analytics. And we've run into features that we weren't necessarily comfortable developing like Mm. some of our clients are publishers so like at the new yorker.com if they wanted to have a list of like top performing authors uh, we've balked away from stuff like that because we don't want an easy way for them to compare their employees and then we know some Mm. layoff decisions are based on that kind of thing so we've stayed away from anything that could be unethical there so the way that i found you originally was somehow you showed up in my timeline. I don't know who I followed on Twitter that I saw an article from you and I I clicked through and I checked it out and I thought it was really interesting. I I think it might have actually been a might have been a political data visualization that you did where there was a there were the debates and there were balloons or something like that. And you could right and you could basically give your real time opinion of, you know, how people were doing in the debates. Yeah. And then I found out that you were were local and I'm like, whoa, this is weird. You know, I can't I didn't think anyone else existed, you know, kind of where I live that, that did this <laughs> kind of thing. Right. The and then city. I started checking out this. What, what's that? Matt? The whole city of people offended right now. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. But so you're not originally from the upstate New York area, though, right? You came originally from where? Yeah, I grew up in Massachusetts, but I had spent five years in Austin, Texas. Oh, before I Matt. moved up to Rochester. And Matt just moved, or as we like to say, he fled. <laughs> he left the one state to go to another. He he lives now in Austin, Texas. That's and right. I live in Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> weird. We're we following got, you. We got all sorts of weird stuff going on here. <laughs> but no, and, and then I started looking into your blog more and more, and there are lots of like really cool data visualizations that you come out with all the time. Like just recently, you tweeted out a React repository in like a radial bar chart, right? Kind of showing what's in there. And then also you did a how to learn D3.js, which is the documentation for D3 or, or the, the modules for D3 data visualized in D3. So it's very <laughs> meta, right? It's very meta, but so you've got basically a visual grouping and map of the modules of D3 done in D3. And I don't know if I'm if this is crazy and I'm totally wrong, but I, I looked at all these things and I'm like, I wonder if that's the way she thinks. Like, I wonder if presenting stuff like this is something that makes sense to you is 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 that any part of this? Um, I I sometimes I see data visualization as like a com a conversation with yourself. So mm. like I'll sketch something on paper and be like, oh, I wonder what that would look like, and then I'll visualize it to look like my paper sketch. But then it never looks as you expect it to look. So then you'll go back and sketch something else, and like that kind of iterative process is really fun for exploring a data set. Like for the React repository, I have no idea what's going on there. I haven't actually um, <laughs> dived in there before. It looks so pretty. <laughs> but but looking at it on GitHub, it's so yeah. confusing, right? Like yeah. you'll go into a folder all the way, and then you'll be like, where am am I? What am I looking at? And so that was really just an exercise for me to say, like, what if we looked at it this other way? Would that give us better insight into like how this is structured? I I don't know if this is useful at all in terms of the way that you presented it here, but it's, it's really cool looking. Like it's really neat to me when you, you take something that's very mundane. Like if you're kind of like going through the the directory listings in GitHub, you're like, ah, you know, whatever. But this visualization is actually 
it's actually pretty and hopefully useful. Like I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm being honest. Like I, I've, I've clicked around and it's been useful to kind of explore, you know, from an exploratory point of view where stuff is. And, and actually I found the outliers in there to be really interesting. Like what are the little tiny radial nodes that are all the way on the outside? You know, I find it kind of interesting how certain things could be that far away, but I guess where I'm kind of going with this or what I mentioned before is, does this make more sense to you then? If you're looking at this in a radial bar chart, does that just resonate with you better than seeing a textual listing of stuff? It's definitely easier for me to parse. And with data viz, you can also visualize something in a few different ways. And I really see each chart or like a good chart is really focused on one question. So looking at looking through the folders you get one view of the code base. Like you can read the code. You can see like what are the different files within a folder. But then if you visualize it within a tree, kind of like I did there, you can see like an overall structure. Like you can answer questions like how deeply nested is this on average? Or like are most files JavaScript or all the JavaScript files chunked in one place? And then you can make a different chart to explore another question. So it, it kind of is how I think, but it's also... I guess, more goal-oriented, if that makes sense. Mm, yeah. I, I mean, again, I was just wondering, you know, you, you got people that are think very visually, and you've got people that uh, that do really well with things like in lists. And I was just wondering, like, you know, maybe people that are drawn to doing data viz are people that this, that this is just how they think, and this is how things make sense to them. And maybe that's what naturally makes you really good at doing data viz. And I'm not saying there isn't a whole lot of hard work. I know that I know that there is, but maybe this is also just something about you. Is that is that possible? Mm, that's definitely possible. I always wonder, like people always say, like I'm a visual learner, or mm. that's pretty much the only one. No one says I'm like a text learner. <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder, like how how like it's always hard to compare different people's experiences and like right. how we think differently. And I'm always curious, like are other people not visual learners or? <laughs> Well, I know how Matt learns. So Matt, is, you've ever seen like a an overview of like a rat in a cage and the rat just goes down every little possible meandering little place in there. That's how Matt learns, right? Mm -hmm. That's basic. That's a fairly good summary. Yeah. yeah you're, a rat, <laughs> you're a rat learner. What kind of learner are you, Patrick? Uh, I, I like videos. Mm. Yeah, I'm definitely a visual learner. I, I like to see someone display something. Uh, yeah, and data visualizations to me work. And I, I feel like I brought him up on the pod before, but I, I have a friend who works for the FAA and his entire job is taking dense data that they have on all things regarded to aviation and turning into visualizations for high, into visualizations for his higher ups. They can't be making decisions on giant Excel spreadsheets. They don't have that type of time. So he literally lives in Tableau all day long, building data visualization. Yeah, I think it, it, the right visualization can make something that would you know make anyone's eyes just glaze over really make sense. And I know I've seen things about uh, Bill Gates talking about different vi visualizations that actually pushed him to create the uh, you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I, I, I'll have to find it for the show notes. But uh, I remember him calling out like one newspaper article and you know the entire article didn't affect him, but the data visualization did. Yeah, and I think these things can be just really helpful in getting something across to someone in a way that the, the raw data doesn't. It's designed, it right? It, it's something yeah. that anyone gets it and can feel feel whether it's working or not, but it's a very different thing to be the person that visualizes and creates and, and uses a, a complex language and process to develop that thing that people will just inherently get. And there's power in being able to translate a big, huge pile of data into something that people can see and kind of, I don't know, make sense of. Amelia, do you, so I think what's what's fascinating to me is I'm, I'm, I really like this challenge of visualizing data and I'm not really great at it. And I'm wondering, like, do you, do, to kind of maybe ask the same question Andrew did. Like, do you watch, uh, you know, geese at a park and think, hmm, I bet if, you know, like, do you start to look for patterns and just kind of naturally approach the world in a way where you're, you're kind of like grouping things and always processing like this? Or do you just live like a normal human being and then <laughs> have some kind of process you apply, you know, while you're working or <laughs> Matt, Matt, that sounds like a very personal question asking whether she watches geese in a park. Well, I you mean, know, I'm thinking of like a beautiful mind where he's watching a football game and he's, he's drawing on a window, you know, cause wow. he's just brilliant. And he's always thinking in a certain framework. Like, is that, does that describe how you approach things and, and make you, you know, like sharpen your ability to tackle these things? Or how do you take like the monumental challenge and, and like know when you've gotten to some useful way of, of toying with it? Like, how do you even sketch and get your head around stuff that you're looking at? Yeah, yeah. For the most part, I think like a normal human. <laughs> 
But it's, there's like, there's a good process you can learn that I think helps with the brainstorming process where you can really break things down into like, okay, what is my data set? What are the different metrics that I have? What types of metrics are they? So I wrote a book and in the book we use a weather data set, which is really good because it has these different metrics. Like you have amount of precipitation for a day, what's the temperature and like Boolean values, like did it rain or something like that. So then once you've figured out what the different metrics that you have are, you can then say, okay, what is my goal? And then which of these metrics do I need to visualize? And then how do I visualize each one of them? So for each of these metrics, you can visualize it as a color or as a position or as an orientation or as the size of something. So you can really break it down to like a bar chart is just, it's one metric basically, at least on one of the axes. So like how wide the bars are, and you're just changing the size of a certain element based on that one metric. So like having a more structured approach like that really helps me to explore a data set. As, and like, I, I don't like make charts in my head before I do this. So it sounds like you kind of clarify or get a clear idea of what your schema is, have a clear idea of the goal, and then use kind of design patterns or like try them out to map between the two maybe is that accurate yeah yeah design patterns or just like going through the different ways you could turn a number into something visual and then i iterate on that because often when you're working with data especially in things like dynamic dashboards they're never going to look the way you think they're going to look. So then you have to go through the code, visualize it, and then say, what isn't working here? Mm. And that's where like the art part of the art part of data viz comes in where I don't often know how it's going to work as like a, a chart experience, right? Like a chart might make a lot of sense in your head, but then you're looking at it and you don't know why, but it doesn't work. And then you just iterate it on it until it kind of makes sense to you. Yeah. So I had a very limited experience doing data visualization, but I, I have written a couple of plugins for a CMS that do have charts and data viz in there in one to one degree or another. So one of the things that I found out, uh, for instance, in, in one of the plugins, I put a radial bar chart in there. And one of the things I found out is the average person just doesn't really understand <laughs> what the hell is going on in a radial bar chart. All right. I had a number of people ask me, like, it looks really nice, but I, I just don't know what it's saying. You know, so maybe that's a, a poor choice for, for my audience there. And then the other one is a, a plugin called WebPerf that what it does is it captures uh, real user measurement or real user metrics for people that visit your website in terms of, uh, you know, time to first bite, first paint, first contentful paint, all that kind of stuff. And then to try and present that in a useful way, it was actually kind of hard for me to figure out, like, even basic things like what charts would show this information in a most useful manner, you mm -hmm. know? And then also things like, how many charts can I have on a page? Or like, right. how many numbers make sense to a user before it's just number overload? Right, right, yeah. And you made a really interesting point earlier, which is that for a long time, we wanted data, right? We're like, we need more data. In mm -hmm. order to really make a good visualization or a good understanding of stuff, we need more data, we need more data, we need more data. And be careful what you wish for, right? Because now we've got so much data that the real problem is combing through it to pull any meaning out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that do you, do you find that that's a big part of what you're trying to do now is just the data set is so huge that in order for anyone to really get get anything out of it, a big part of your job is to kind of present it all in some kind of a, a manner that will make sense to people. Yeah. At, at my job, actually, most of the developers are back end developers because we just get so much data and most of the work is really just processing it and the whole pipeline for get like managing it and getting it into a manageable state. So a lot of like freelance data visualizers will also have to develop their data munging skills and database skills and data pipeline skills, uh, which is like a whole nother field, right? So I, I do like more basic data analysis, but I try to stay away from like turning billions of data points into hundreds of thousands of data points. It just seems like a, a big part of what you must be doing is sort of, you know, trying to bring bring form to the chaos, you know what I mean? And it just is really kind of interesting to me that you must be at some point, you know, working with a data set and you're like, oh, this doesn't really make sense. And then you are arranging it in such a way where finally the pattern starts to appear. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's always a good moment. And sometimes I don't get there and I just drop it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But, okay, so how do you rule how do you rule bias out of it? You know what I mean? So let's say you were you were and I realized that the political one that you did was just for fun, but let's say that there was one person in that debate that you really liked. How do you keep your bias out of it in terms of like, you know, give maybe you give them like a, a, a color that people are drawn to or something like that? You know? <laughs> I definitely you, did that. <laughs> Oh, you did. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, the answer like is teal did. color. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I had no idea that you actually did that. So, but but it's a, a scenario that makes sense that would happen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, are oh, you being arrested? <laughs> yeah. But she said that she said it. She had given preference. The data of his police are after her. I know. Oh my god. Yeah, that's they, what they're it they're is. very good. They're really fast. Yeah. <laughs> Their charts are fantastic. <laughs> 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 Big data is real. But no, seriously. Okay. I understand that, you know, that political one or whatever was just kind of a fun thing that you did with uh, a friend of yours, I think, mm-hmm. uh, or a colleague or whatever. But, you know, let's say it is some kind of a serious application of something. How do you, how do you keep your bias out of it? Or, and, and then, and then what if, what if someone asks you to put bias in? Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's, well, there's personal bias. And then there's right. also like a lot of people think of data as like this ground truth, but mm. all data comes from some perspective or sure. something like that. So one thing to be aware of when you're visualizing data is like, you really should understand how the data were collected and who did it and like what ways could it be biased? So there's understanding the bias of the underlying data and trying to control for that. And then then understanding personal bias is probably harder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's tough. But it's see, here's the thing, though. Like, if I'm someone that I want to look at this data visualization because I just can't be bothered to read the whole article, am I really going to vet, you know, how the data was collected and captured and maybe even be able to understand that? Yeah. Well, I think it's the same as the text in an article, right? Where sure. when someone uses words, they could sure. use a different word that means something a little bit differently. With data viz, you can use like a, a color that people perceive more negatively or something like that. Um, Does it happen? Oh, yeah, for sure. And I think especially in the way I see it, there's exploratory data viz and explanatory data viz where the explanatory data viz are more these like the news articles that have data visualizations built in. And those really have a point to make, right? Mm. They're there to support a point that the article is making. So that's supporting evidence. Usually, yeah. 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 And it's hard because... It's it's the same way I see science where I'm, Amelia, they really are coming out. <laughs> what is going on? I live next to a hospital and a fire station. <laughs> so did you did your real estate agent you know make this fact known to you before you moved in? But it, there's also a huge graveyard, so it's quiet most of the time. <laughs> wow, that's very self-sustaining. Very convenient if things go yeah, awry. Uh, you have quite the round trip there. That's yeah, fantastic. everything's nearby if something goes yeah. wrong. But you, you were saying about articles are, you know, typically the data is in there or it's, it's supporting evidence? Yeah, usually that's, that's what it's there for. Oh, I was saying, this is kind of how I feel about science, where people who write scientific pieces that are more for like a layman audience, they're condensing these really complicated scientific facts into a narrative that people can understand. But they're also, they have this like implicit built in, like people think they're experts and they're saying, well, science is saying this. So people who write these articles really have to be careful about what they're saying because people will trust them no matter what they say. They'll read like one sentence and then think it's a scientific fact. And I think it's the same with a chart where people say, this chart is the truth and look this is real data behind this chart so i'm gonna trust whatever it says so i think there's a lot of responsibility when you're you're creating charts especially for like news outlets yeah that's tough because like matt said data viz is in at least in some part design and design and data viz can present something that people will just immediately have some kind of a reaction to it Mm -hmm. you know so you're kind of immediately communicating something to them and i think that that can be super powerful you know and it's, it's interesting to to hear your thoughts on the the fact that uh, you know you gotta you gotta vet the sources there too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
So I've seen a number of the the data visits that you do, and a lot of them seem, I could be wrong, but some of them just seem like you've seen something and, and you're like, you get this idea and you're like, oh, I'm going to try and do a data viz of that, right? So for instance, the the React JS one, is that something that kind of just happens? Like you'll run into something and you're like, oh, I think I can use my superpowers to, to make this kind of interesting. Oh yeah, I am always on the lookout for good data sets to visualize. So I have one for you. Do you take commissions or you do this just for fun or? Normally do it for fun. I I've started doing a few contracts here and there. So what if you did one, you did a data visualization on bed bug outbreaks in New York City? Oh. <laughs> Do we have that data? Yes, there's a, I, there, I found it. It's bedbugregistry.com. And you can go there and you can go to Metro New York City. And they have this like really, they have a data visualization of it there, but it's kind of lousy. Do you think that, you know, you might be able to do something interesting with that? Yeah, that'd be really fun, actually. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to I'm gonna give you a, a link to that and maybe, you know, who knows? I mean, the show won't be out for a little bit. Maybe we'll have a bed bug visualization. And shout out to our, our poor co-host, Jennifer Blumberg, who couldn't oh, make shit. it because she's experiencing one of the said outbreaks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not a data set you want to be a data point in. Yeah. Well, we can we put a little a little happy face over her address, right? Or we're going to do it. <laughs> so are, we, are we all just throwing out requests right now for visual? Yeah. Visual? So <laughs> I think the bed bug one, the bed bug one, I think is actually pretty interesting. So I'm looking at a map of it right now. And it's actually pretty interesting to see where it's located. I can see places where I just wouldn't stay. <laughs> Like, I just wouldn't get anywhere near them. I have one that's just as important. Okay, what's that? Emoji used across the planet. Like, what what are the patterns of of humans using emoji? GIFs maybe, but that'd be harder. But pick like Twitter or whatever. What are the patterns and people utilizing emoji? I feel like someone just did this too. Oh, did that happen? Yeah, I don't know where it was. I kept seeing it pop up on Twitter. No, Google it. Yeah, apparently people use... What was it? It was like the crying emoji. The crying laughing emoji is the most popular. Yeah. Joy in Slack. Yeah. Yeah. I use that one a lot. But seriously, like I think that would be really neat. So if you if you do decide to do something with the bed bug outbreak thing, like let me know. Because I would love to see that. I, I definitely I think, will let you know. <laughs> I think that would be I think that would be really neat. So how did you end up? Did you purposefully get into this career of doing data viz, or is it something you kind of fell into from a design and, and UX point of view? Um Hmm. So I started, I actually went to college for neuroscience and psychology, and my plan was to become a prison psychologist. (laughs) Oh. Um, But I went to such a small school that I needed research experience because there wasn't much at my school. So I ended up moving to Austin after school to work in a memory lab and to get that experience before grad school. And then I hung out with a lot of grad students and decided that I did not want to go to grad school. (laughs) (laughs) So I tried to use my like psychology background to work into more of like a user experience research position. At the same time, I was learning how to code. And I guess I redid my personal website like five, 10 times. I don't know. It's normal. (laughs) Totally normal. And then I got a job that's actually very similar to my current job at a startup in Austin as their front end developer. And they had a huge dashboard. So I think I kind of fell into it where... I've always been working on dashboards and I have a statistics background and a research background and kind of like a user experience background, Mm. but while working like a developer job. So it kind of just came naturally where I was working on a lot of dashboard design thing, like solutions, like we have this new feature, people want to understand this metric, how should we lay it out that they'll best understand it? So I've been doing that for maybe eight years now. Oh, wow. Well, Let's say that we have been doing, you know, the kind of charts that uh, we all mentioned in terms of we've been using a little charting library somewhere, but we're interested in maybe taking it to the next level and checking out this D3 thing. So first of all, like, what is D3? Yeah. What is it? Yeah. What is it? So D3 stands for data driven documents. And the way I see charting on the web is there's a spectrum. And on one end is like Tableau and GUIs where you kind of drag and drop or you select whatever data you want to look at and it makes a line chart or scatter plot or something. And then on the complete other end is D3 where it's this pretty low level library that really just has a ton of utility methods that help. Like, hey, I have this data. I, 
this array of numbers? How do I turn that into a line that I can put on a line chart? But it, it doesn't make line charts. It makes the fundamentals of different charts. So it's like as low level as you can get while using a library on the web. And so it's something that probably appeals to a data scientist, right? Because it's not it's not giving you a pie chart to make. It's giving you the tools to build kind of whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. I think for a lot of de developers who work on like smaller dashboards or websites, they're, they should end up using just a chart library because there's a ton of chart libraries that even hook up to whatever framework you're using. Like there's a ton of React data viz libraries. Yeah. And the fun fact about that is that they're most or all of them are built off of D3. Like they use D3 as a dependency because it has all of these great great utilities that otherwise you'd just be building from scratch. Well, yeah, you'd just be making it over again, yeah, exactly. right? <laughs> yeah, right. So what's the point? I mean, one of the, one of the libraries that I have found that I really like and I've been using is for my purposes is uh, called Apex Charts. Hmm. I've heard and of it. it's not it's nice because it, it will actually generate SVGs. So the resulting instead of, um, you know, a lot of the other charting libraries that I've worked with are generating charts just on a canvas. The nice thing about the fact that it generates SVG charts is that you can then have like a downloadable copy for a client or something that can be embedded in a report, you know, nicer than just a screenshot of it or whatever. And, you know, for my layman's purposes in terms of making charts, it works really nice. And it has a nice view wrapper for it. It's got a nice React wrapper for it. And I've really enjoyed it. I have also played around with D3 a little bit. But, you know, honestly, I think the last time I played with it, I'm just like, I think I actually said to myself, like, I just want to make a pie chart. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I, I think I sobbed my, to myself softly and walked off and found something else to, to do it with. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit like using a chainsaw to cut a sandwich or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you wrote a whole book on this, right? Full stack D3 and data visualization, right? Yes, I did. So people are building their whole careers off of this D3 thing. I suppose the, the D3 is really hard to learn because it's just the, the API is so large. And for such right. a long time, it was seen as this monolithic library where like I have to learn D3 and mm -hmm. it's used uh, a lot of the examples are kind of similar to like older jQuery code where mm. you don't use a templating library you just alter the DOM using D3 so a lot of people have trouble using it and there are more modern applications where people are using React or Vue or Angular or anything like that. Yeah. And in doing my research, you know, I found an article that said why I no longer use D3. Is it something that is D3 this monolithic thing that is, you know, big and slow and, you know, we shouldn't be using it? Or is this guy just not really understanding the way it works? Or, you know, where, where do you take it? Because it sounds to me from what you're saying is D3 is almost the opposite of a huge library that makes tons of assumptions. It's it's just this massively broad collection of utilities that you then kind of stitch together and can make whatever you want out of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I've been trying to make that point over and over again, because I think the perception of D3 as this one library is very pervasive. And that's right. kind of why I did the D3 blog post is I just want people to understand that they don't need to follow the examples that they find for Vatum. Like a lot of this is how I learned D3. And this is how most people learn D3 is they'll say, OK, I need to make a line chart. And then they'll go, they'll Google D3 line chart. They'll copy and paste the code. They'll put it in their in their own application. And then they'll edit values until it works. <laughs> and then they have to maintain it. And they like kind of have no idea what's happening because it's a decent amount of code. <laughs> So coming from there is it's like really hard to learn D3. But if you come at it from, OK, what do I need to create a line chart and then understand piece by piece? What are the different concepts that it can help you with? Like it can help you convert from a temperature value into a pixel value, which corresponds to like how far down the chart my line is or like each point is. And that's what I loved about that visualization that you did of the D3 modules is that it's using D3 to show how broad the API, or I don't even know if API is the right word, but how broad the, the modules are that you can use in D3 are. Yeah, it's really and a that, huge library. <laughs> yeah, I don't actually, I mean, the the visualization, and we'll, we'll link to it in, in the show notes, notes, it actually reminded me of a whole bunch of Petri dishes, <laughs> you know? Yeah, a little bit. And yeah, and then all the little things in there were like little microorganisms that were kind of crawling around in there. But it, it sounds like... <sighs> 
Do I have to be a, a data professional to be using D3? Or do you think it's something that is approachable enough that, you know, if Patrick needed to do it for his next bed bug out- outbreak chart, like he could reasonably do that? <laughs> I knew we were going back to bed bugs. <laughs> Uh, everyone's got to go back to bed at some point, you know. <laughs> um, sorry, I get distracted by the bed bugs. Oh, I understand. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to focus, you know. <laughs> okay, your question was when is it when is it appropriate to use D three? Should, it, should it yeah, it, 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 if someone's never touched D three before, but they know they need data visualization, feel like it would help to convey a message, to improve a website, whatever it is, I, would you recommend someone just get in and try to learn it? Is it too much to bite off? I. I I'll personally start in. I, I mentioned I've used C3 before, which is almost like a wrapper on top of it that abstracts away a lot of the minutiae and lets you just kind of get to building things. All right, what do you think about tools? I'm looking at C3, NVD3, Dimple. Are, are those, have you been aware of those? What, what do you recommend? Going full hog or using a wrapper? Yeah, yeah. I think for people who are in a time crunch and they just want to slap a line chart or a scatter flat on, yes. for sure, go for one of these higher level chart libraries you will just be frustrated (laughs) and disappointed if you try (laughs) but for anyone who wants something more custom or they kind of need charts that are branded or they have like similar styles that are with cohesive with their the company's brand or they have the time it's definitely a good skill set to learn and if you go through the right tutorial or the right book that really teaches things with their concepts I think it really won't take that much time to to climb up the learning curve and feel somewhat sufficient to be able to create whatever charts they want. So I feel like if if having a chart in something you're working on is an occasional thing that you do, that D3 might not make a whole lot of sense because it it and you Tell me if you think I'm right or wrong on this. But if your job is making charts, then the investment in learning D3 is 100% worth it? 100% worth it. And I would say it's almost worth it for people who every now and then need to make a chart. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, I'll use the utilities for things like I've used them for like a date picker because it has some great date utilities. (laughs) So I'll use it even now. Tell your fiance about this? (laughs) He he doesn't know. Okay. And what else? He does. He does now. Just so you know. (laughs) (laughs) If he listens, yeah. All right. (laughs) And I use it for like um, more stylistic things. Like if we want like a moving line on a page that looks nice or something like that. It's I think don't learn it all at once, but maybe learn a few different modules and then like wait a little bit and see how you can use those in your day to day development tasks. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest with you, like in seeing your Twitter timeline and some of the blogs that you posted and some of the things that you worked on, like I'm like that more than anything inspired me to want to learn this thing Mm -hmm. because it's like you have this super ability now because you are really well versed in this thing that anytime you see anything interesting you can pretty easily just like plug the data into it and just play around with it in in different charts to see what it looks like i mean is that kind of what you're doing yeah totally and it's not just data viz i'm also interested in like education and figuring out how we can use the web to develop our methods of education, our methods of communication. Like I feel like a lot of the web is just like, well, we had newspapers and now we have this internet thing and we can put the newspapers online, which is great because everyone can now read the newspaper. But like Mm -hmm. there's so many things that the web can do. Why are we just using text to communicate our thoughts? And we've talked about your blog a few times and I feel like that's demonstrated beautifully on your blog. And even if somebody listening is terrified to even touch or or look at D3, Amelia's blog is fantastic. Like the, the examples of things follow you around and appear and kind of stick at the right time. And it's like a very rich exploration of whatever it is that she happens to be talking about. Your blog is super cool and uh, frustrating and how (laughs) how just well visualized everything is that you're talking about. Not even just like the visualizations, but the way that you present information. Super cool and, and worth challenging anyone who writes posts like to think about how they're presenting them. I thought that was super and totally worth mentioning. Yeah, but I mean, Amelia, you're totally right because, you know, in the the freelance and agency game, you know, we talk about things like brochure site, right? Mm-hmm. And brochures are like this print thing, <laughs> Mm -hmm. This this hangover from when there was a physical brochure that you actually passed out to someone. And is that all a web page can really be? Is that I mean, that's 
that's kind of sad, right? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, that's kind of how I feel. And sometimes I feel a little bit guilty because as we move away from text, and this is probably a lot of the reason that most websites just have text, uh, we have a much harder time with things like accessibility, mm. whether that's across browser or for people who don't browse the web normally. So it, it really is really hard <laughs> at right. this point to do anything novel because you really have to think about that kind of thing. And I'm not saying I do a good job of it, but yeah, it definitely gets harder. No, for sure. I mean, and the irony was not lost on me that we were doing a podcast, which is an audio only medium about data visualization, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, you know, where's the visual component? But, you know, we're making it work. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I listen to a few data viz podcasts and they always end up trying to describe different like complex yeah. charts and it's it never works. <laughs> yeah. Imagine yeah. a circle now. But I, I think the most daring thing that I saw on your site, honestly, Amelia, is that you, if you scroll down to the bottom, you have a link that says, ask me anything on Twitter. Yeah, but no like, one does. <laughs> I, I'm not, I, you are braver than I am because I'm not, I don't put that on my site. <laughs> don't, people ask me stuff, you know, anyway, but I don't know. All right. I, Nobody does. I think this is how I view Twitter too, is like, there's this threshold of visitors <laughs> or followers where I haven't reached it yet. So things are still really friendly. Everyone's really nice. Uh, But then once you get, I hear once you get 10,000 followers, things get not as nice. And you kind of have to put these protective measures around yourself. Yeah. And you know what? I was thinking about that the other day. And then I was just like, well, what the hell is the point then? Because I've seen people who have worked really, really hard to like build up their their followers and everything. And then once they get to that point, I mean, then what they're doing is they're taking mental health breaks and they're Mm -hmm. cutting their interactions. And I'm just like, well, okay, what was the point here then? Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah, it's rough. I don't know. I mean, it is nice to have... Oh, I played around like the React repository thing. I played around with that. I had like a few hours last night, so I messed around with that. And then I tweeted out this morning and then to get feedback of like, oh, maybe you can try this or like, hey, I also worked on something similar. That's awesome. And I love having more people to respond to something like that. But yeah, you're right. It's a it's a fine line. Yeah, I just found that I found that interesting. But a really neat data visualization that I found that I don't know if you have run into, but there is a a Webpack plugin that it will actually do, I think it's called a Webpack Bundle Analyzer. Mm -hmm. What it does is it will look at the uh, bundles that you have built and then show you like exactly what is in there. And it does it in kind of a a really nice data viz way. I was like really impressed by it. Have you seen that at all? Yeah, I think it makes a tree map and it also exports like a JSON file. So you could even grab that data and do something else else with it if you really wanted to. Yeah, I thought that was a really neat use of data viz. And and actually, it was unexpected because it's just coming from a command line build tool kind of thing. And you don't expect to see something like that, but it was really cool. Yeah. It's really neat. Yeah, I really yeah. like it. And also I kind of hate it <laughs> because Why do you I hate get it? this sense of shame when I look at all my node modules. <laughs> <laughs> so are, are you going to use your superpowers to focus on yourself and, you know, bury down and, and, and optimize your site, maybe? I could. <laughs> you could. I might. <laughs> so that's a no. I don't know. I just I see my personal site as a playground and right. thinking about doing things like optimizing performance or like all these things I have to do at work <laughs> makes me a little bit sad and not want to do it. <laughs> yeah, it's no longer yeah. fun. Is, is there like what are the things that you look at as like the 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 coolest or the most effective or inspirational visualizations like are, are there things that you kind of have in your head always that you're trying to like model or even just kind of nail to that level of of depicting a problem or something yeah there's there's this one site that i really like called the pudding it's at pudding.cool is their url and they do a fantastic job it's like if the upshot if the upshot were its own publication they go pretty deep their last article was exploring how people laugh online (laughs) and like people say lol or haha oh yeah that's the funniest thing about lol is now it's so common that people are just like lol i actually laugh (laughs) you know what i mean like because lol like no one is actually laughing when they type lol you know no it's a lie. Yeah, it's a total lie. Mm. And then what? another thing I think about a lot recently is how animation comes into play. I don't know if you guys saw Twitter was full of all these bar chart races recently where it's just a bar chart of something like 
different country, top 10 countries by GDP. And then it animates through time. So you can see how it changes from the 50s to now. And people will just sit and watch these bar chart races for like three or four minutes. And it's like, these are probably the same people who would look at an article and say, oh, this is this state of is is too complicated. I'm not going to spend the time to understand it. Mm. So there's this weird interplay between data viz and animation and like engaging story. viewers. Yeah, your storytelling. Well, that's the that's the superpower that I was kind of mentioning, because it, it is the case that people will look at a big, long article that might discuss what you're talking about, and they're not going to bother with it, but they will sit there passively and consume this data viz that you're doing. And I didn't see the one that you're talking about, but I did see a bar chart race. I didn't even know that was a term. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't know that's what I was watching, but it was on the browser wars and which browser dominated. And it was pretty fascinating to watch. I'll be honest with you. It was really cool to see, you know, one thing kind of grow and take over. And it reminded me of... Of, of watching those and I'm again going to get back to the metaphor the uh, petri dish where you watch like an accelerated video of things like growing and dying you know yeah and you also get to have your own narrative with it so like when you're watching it gives you enough time to say like oh I remember um, Netscape or <laughs> like oh yeah I remember when that happened I'm mostly just sitting there like eating Cheetos and stuff you know? <laughs> no, getting getting orange stuff on my fingertips while I'm watching this <laughs> there's this other one that I really liked that I wanted to talk about which was I think it came out a few years ago in the New York Times where it was it wasn't even an article. It was just a blank chart where the X axis was was something like educational attainment and the Y oh no, no the Y axis was educational attainment and the X axis was something like um socioeconomic class of someone's family. Okay. And then it was they it just said draw what you think the line is or what you think the relationship is between these two variables. So then people would like sit there and then they think about it and then they draw like, oh, I think it it like goes up here, it goes down here. And then after they drew it, it would then show them what the actual relationship was. And so that was cool because they got to a lot of the times when you're reading an article, you can just read about like, oh, it's this way. And then you can think to yourself like, oh, yeah, I already knew that. <laughs> right. But then you for this, you have to put down onto paper what it actually what you actually think it was and like spend more time actually thinking about it and then figuring out how you're wrong. And the really cool part was that they had a follow up article that showed aggregate responses from everyone. So then they also got this new data set of what do people think the relationship is, which was really cool. That's really neat. You're going to have to give me that link because we want to get that in the in the show notes. And Definitely. That about wraps it up for another episode of the devmode.fm podcast. If you'd like to have every episode delivered to your favorite player, you can subscribe via RSS or find us on iTunes or Google Play. And if you like what we're doing, please review us on iTunes. It's the best way to help others find the show. You can follow us on Twitter at devmode.fm. And we love to hear your thoughts on this episode. Just leave us a comment on the devmode.fm website where we can continue the conversation. For the devmode.fm podcast, I'm Andrew Welch. I'm Patrick Harrington. I'm Matt Stein. And thank you, Emilio Wattenberger, for coming on. Amelia? Thank you for having me. <laughs> the dad of its okay. police daughter. <laughs>